All right. So welcome to Nash RB. Um, and tonight's topic is uh, GDPR on Rails, the working Rubius briefing on designing for security, privacy, and consent. Uh, I'm John Sloan. I work here at Ramsey, and I'm super stoked to have everybody here. And I'm really excited to have uh, Frank here. Frank and I met at Southeast Ruby last year. Um, I don't know, how many of you were at Southeast Ruby last year, by any chance? Okay, cool. Um, so, quick shout out for Southeast Ruby. That is happening again this year, August 2nd and 3rd, but it's happening right here. So, that's really cool. You guys, go get tickets, Southeast Ruby. Come back here. Uh, so, Frank, we met uh, last year, and Frank is a web application security architect, author, and speaker. He's a computer scientist with a master's in information security from the College of Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology and founder of the Atlanta-based security forum, Rietta Inc. And so I want to thank Frank for coming, and I want to thank the sponsors, which Ramsey uh, for food and space, and then Beachy for beverages. And the last thing I want to say before I bring Frank up is straight through the open door back here is the restrooms. Just keep walking till you run into a wall, hang a right, and the bathrooms are back there. Um, and I also noticed that there's some coffee that was made this afternoon that I got some of it and it's still hot. If somebody wants to drink some coffee, it's on the way through there. Um, so without any more of me speaking, Frank Rieta. Get some water here for a second, make sure this works. We'll go to my actual cover slide. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I'm glad to have been able to come up. I'm, so I'm from Atlanta. My coworker Brandon Dees couldn't make it tonight because he, even though he lives here, his wife is graduating from graduate school tomorrow. So her family's in town. So he's been running around doing all sorts of, of stuff there. Um, hopefully a, a friend of mine will come by. He needs, he was a little, probably a little late due to work, but he and I go way back. So I'm gonna tell you a minute from, in a minute, about one of my first businesses that got me into security. Well, I was 17 and my friend Jonathan was 12 when we started that business. And uh, we were quite the crew. I wish I had a photo in this presentation about that. So who all here codes Ruby? <clears throat> awesome. Who here knows anything about security? Okay. Who here thinks they're security expert-ish? Okay. <laughs> who has heard about GDPR? Is that why you're here? Okay, well, you might not have ever thought that GDPR and Ruby on Rails was gonna be part of the same talk, but the fun part is, as developers, our companies that use our software can't be compliant with legal stuff unless our, we have features that let them be compliant, and so there's a certain level of knowledge that all of us need, otherwise we don't know when we're missing something that could matter. So that's the purpose of this talk today. So my title is Web Application Security Architect because when you have a four-person company, CEO and president mean nothing. Uh, so it's more important to focus on what you do. And so uh, I, for years, called myself a developer and that confused people. And then, <laughs> so it's like, this is what I really do. Um, let's see. So to talk about that earlier, so if we draw two circles and look at uh, the circle of developers, and the circle of security, there's really not a tremendous amount of overlap. So let me ask this question. How many here were at B-Sides Nashville at Lipscomb University a few weeks ago? Exactly what I thought. So one other addition to me, I knew that question, answer. Um, how many of you have been to any security conference? Very cool. How many have been to a developer conference? So this goes to prove my diagram is not far off. 
And so let me ask another follow-up question. How many know about the OWASP top 10? Okay, one. And I guess the ASVS is the Advanced Security Verification Standard. Yep. So when I asked this for um, the Atlanta Slack, so these are professional developers who are paid money to do development for companies. They are building apps, they're building web applications. Almost 40% had never heard of the OWASP Top 10 nor the ASVS. So don't worry, you are in good company. Um, but what this means is there's a group of people that are flying blind for the most part about the most common ways that applications are compromised. So if, if I would recommend looking up the OWASP Top 10 and just being familiar with all those. And if you have any questions about that, hit me up after this presentation and we, we can talk about those. And so when you don't know where you're going, when you have no map, you don't know what uh, ways an application could be compromised, lots of things can go wrong. You could not be enforcing HTTPS, which leads to SSL stripping attacks. It leads to a lot of problems. You could have poor credential management, especially amongst developers. Uh, SQL injection. So, okay, yes, Ruby on Rails by default is not going to have a SQL injection, but just a week ago, I had to toss back code to a developer working for one of my clients because his code failed uh, code review because one of his modules ha was just rife with interpolating strings, uh, user supplied data into a query, and it was just completely unacceptable. Of course, that held up the feature and the sprint and made all of the management excited, but we, hey, it's security. We can't let that stuff slip in. Sensitive data exposure, this happens all the time, especially backups, maybe not as secured as well as the production systems. And we'll skip down the uh, developer's laptops can be stolen and inadvertently logging sensitive data. And this happens, thanks Twitter. Seriously, like today I, I logged in and I got this pop-up telling me that they inadvertently logged my plain text password. That made me feel great. So a good thing is a 60 character random string. Um, so what we really need is this purple team approach. If we bring the red and the blue closer together, we combine what we do, and so more developers should know more about security and go to security conferences, and more security people should go to developer conferences and know a bit about what we have to do for our jobs as the blue team. So um, I'm gonna talk about one of the tools that we have. Who here uses user stories at work? And for the rest of you, do you do like use cases, like full page documentation? Yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? You know, Agile Fall, or is it? <laughs> um, so there's a variant also called an abuser story, which is a user story from the per point of view of a malicious adversary. And then we can also do security requirements as part of our user story acceptance criteria. So, okay, so user story time. So what is a user story? So instead of having a ream of documentation that is a mile wide, what we do is we, we try to keep it short and simple. So the alliteration is card, um, conversation, and confirmation. So the, the C squared, or cubed. And so you write it, it's enough that it can fit on a card. You have a, it's a placeholder for conversation. So this is, interesting for policy people because there's a lot of things that are required to be part of a document that has um, artifacts as part of the process and user stories by default are designed to not be artifacts. They're supposed to be temporary in nature. Um, we'll get into a little bit with the GDPR requires something called a data privacy assessment which is supposed to be part before in a project even kicks off, signing off on the risks at an organizational level and so how that gets combined. Um, so you can add security statements to a user story. So here's an example of a good one. As a staff member, I can choose the assist customer button to log in as that customer. Um, so what this is called a masquerading feature. How many people have created a masquerading feature? Yep. Did your masquerading feature have accountability that demonstrated logged who, what, when, and where the masquerading took place? Non-compliant. You have a user that is able to masquerade as another and also a source of a data breach. So the second bullet point, um, staff members should be required to be authenticated with two-factor authentication. Did your masquerading feature have two-factor authentication? Oh, well, okay. So 
So what we know, by the way, is 63% of data breaches are the result of lost or stolen credentials, and a tremendous number of spear phishing attacks are directed after either high-ranking officials and companies or customer service agents. Because what is it about the customer service agents? They have access to a lot of data. So they're often a gold mine, and it's often a call center person who may not you know, just be on their, the top of their game for not clicking the fish. So you got to design presuming that your internal users have to be held to a higher level, a higher security standard than your external users. The abuser story. So this is a user story written from the point of view of a malicious adversary. And the purpose is to answer your favorite question for management, but why would anyone ever do that? Because what happens is, um, when we're designing features, we're designing for the happy path we're looking at, but you know, I want to log in, I want to do this, and I want to do that. We miss things like the URL tweaker. So as an authenticated customer, I see what looks like my account number in the URL, so I change it to another number to see what will happen. This is called a direct object reference. It's one of the major OWASP top 10 failures that leads to significant number of breaches. So if we wrote an abuser story about this, we would have an acceptance criteria that would become part of the automated test suite that would actually exercise that calling for random IDs does not give you data. So the purpose of the abuser story is to be a placeholder for security control often. Otherwise, it's so because we can't treat it as a non-functional requirement. So now we can talk about GDPR. It's called the General Data Protection Regulation, and it goes into full enforcement on May 25th of this month. <laughs> so it's been, a lot of companies have been working on this for a couple of years. If you're just starting now, it's probably too late. <laughs> you're probably going to get sued out of existence on the, no, I'm just kidding. There's a lot of stuff you can do, and it's better to start where you are <laughs> than to, yeah, exactly. So, Big fines. We're talking $24 million per incident, potentially. So, I mean, if you're a tiny startup, are you going to get hit? Maybe not. But I believe it has been stated May 26, three weeks from now, we're going to start hitting, hearing the news about fines being slapped against non-compliant companies. And they intend these fines to be what's called dissuasive what that means is they're going to monetarily execute companies to make examples of them so that everyone else stands to attention and gets in line and starts deal uh, complying with GDPR. So that is, <laughs> if that doesn't scare <laughs> your co-founder or your board, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, or it's 4% of global revenue. So for Google, that's only like $3 billion per breach. Like that, even they couldn't deal with that. It is based on the idea of demonstrated compliance. What this means is it's not like where the state has to prove you guilty and you, and you have the presumption of innocence. When the, if they say, we think you may not be compliant with our law, you are expected to demonstrate your compliance by supplying documentation of where you have in your organization taken care of all the requirements of compliance, that you've had the meetings, that you have the notes about the business process, that you have the right people in place, that you have to demonstrate compliance. And if you fail that, they could le levy fines. Um, another idea that's come up is, but we're an American company, is it going to touch us? Uh, the answer could be no, if you have minimum interaction with Europe, but two things can happen. They see this as an import regulation, so if you create a piece of software that is then used inside the Eurozone, they look at that the same as if you loaded up a container of product and shipped it over there. So their, their import regulations apply to you, and there's plenty of treaties in place to do enforcement internationally for, treat, uh, for violations of import regulations. Um, also, European companies are prohibited from doing business in situations where their software services are not compliant. So if your software is incapable of being compliant and you or any of your customers wanted to do business in Europe, that could potentially be a financial roadblock. And then, of course, uh, the United States has done a great job enforcing our laws extraterritorially when we needed to, so it's a bit of payback time. So um, I'm not an attorney, so, but... 
You know, does your, we talked earlier, does your CEO ever want to travel to Europe again? Uh, I guess if you didn't pay the fine and you didn't take place in the court proceedings, but there's a court ruling against your organization, uh, I do not know all the means under the law, but I presume they are there. So we can talk a little bit about a couple things. So they have the concept of a data controller and a data processor. And uh, these definitions matter. So in the past, uh, under the previous privacy regime, um, the data controller had all the liability and the processors had none. So if you have a software as a service company and you process data that your clients use, they might be the data controller and you're the processor. Then you have sub-processors, so things like your technology stack. So if you use cloud-based services as part of your design, if you have you know, Google Drive, if you have MailChimp, these are all third-party sub-processors. It's important to know this because you're gonna be expected to communicate clearly to users all the places that their personal data is, is shared with. So for example, in your privacy statement, you now have to say things like, we share your your email address and IP, uh, your email address and consent to receive marketing emails with Mailchimp. If if you use Mailchimp, you can't just um, blindly go. And we'll look at an example later. Um, so, for example, if you create a software as a service and one of your clients is uh, Acme Corporation, which is a multinational company with um, hundreds of thousands of employees all over the world and they have employees in Europe using the, the software as a service that you provide, then you are a data processor and the Acme Corporation is a data controller. What that means also is that you have to have certain compliance stuff in place. So that's more of the business side, so we'll move on, but this stuff matters. And so when you talk to your management, tell them, hey, we may be a processor or a data controller and you need to look into what that means legally because there's contract obligations. So what is data processing? So it is storage in physical or, or electronic form. It is loading into memory for any purpose. It is looking at by a person for any purpose. It is organizing the data, transmitting the data, publishing the data. It's all actions with data. So the big idea, uh, well actually, we go back to this. So when we think about data breaches, we like to think about it means an unauthorized external person stole our data. They hacked into our system and took data, right? That's a data breach. Under GDPR, a breach happens the moment that one of your staff members looks at data for, the purpose, for a business purpose that's not specifically authorized by lawful basis or consent. That means that it doesn't actually have to be stolen by anybody. It means that you breached your compliance with the privacy regulations which goes back to that you never own the data. Your customers own their personal data at all times. The ownership never transfers to you just because you have a database under European law. Um, you, a question came up earlier. You can own derivatives of the data, but it has to be anonymized. You can't own the linkage of the derivative data to the natural person. Uh, so that is something that can get a lot of companies that have, this is like antithetical to the idea that we spin up a data lake and we throw everything in and we do big data analytics on it. Um, your data lake is basically a toxic asset under the GDPR, unless you have every security control in place that's designed to protect the privacy of the user. So surprisingly sensitive data includes email addresses, IP addresses, surnames, phone numbers, address, location, photos, they consider this all as sensitive as we would have considered social security numbers um, without specific permission. So um, that is quite a lot. And then extra sensitive data, this is the stuff that is, um, also seems odd to us, would include racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data. Um, it's not just things that we would normally think of as being financial data. So any of this type of data has to have extraordinary security controls if your company touches it at all. So one of the rights that the European citizens have is the right to access. So how many people have ever looked at Google Takeout? Okay. So you're gonna see this more and more because it's required by law. What right to access means is if a European citizen or data subject, they could be living in the United States, has the right to demand that your company provide every piece of data that you have on them, and you have 30 days to comply. 
This does not just mean that's easily accessible in your database. This means that if there's a spreadsheet that mentions the identifiable data of someone on an analyst computer on floor three of your building, then you have to include that in your com comprehensive export of all their data. So the breadth of this for organizations can get huge. Thankfully, startups often have it a little bit easier. The right to rectification. So this is a lot like when you run your credit report and you're like, man, I never lived there. You have the right to then tell the credit reporting agency to fix their data. This now applies to all personal data. So not only do you have to have the right to access where you show them everything they have, your software has to support the right to correct anything, even if it's in a back office system. Um, and then have allowed the business to have processes around that. Uh, the right to be forgotten. Um, formally, it's called the right to erasure. So what this means is your software has to be designed so that data can be deleted at any time. But you also get to have controls around this, which we'll go into an example later. Um, so it's, it's not perfect. It's not, you, it's not just that you have to delete just because people ask, but you have to support it. And a lot of times software has trouble deleting data you know, we, we design with primary keys. No, you know, we never need to delete that. Soft delete's not enough. You know, setting deleted at to a date time and hiding it is not deletion in this case. So your software's gonna have to support business processes around that. The right to restriction of processing. So when we design software, we're gonna have to add new columns, new fields to track um, when data is restricted. So that means that you have the lawful basis potentially um, examples. Say you're, you're writing software for a mortgage servicer, and so you can send bills and make sure collections happen, but uh, the customer wishes to restrict their data for all other purposes. You have to support them being able to restrict for any other business purpose. We'll get into consent in a minute, but the software has to support that. Uh, the right to data portability in a machine readable format. So we, the right to access is what is all the data that you have on me? This is a little bit, this is gonna trip people up. So you know how we can move phone numbers from one phone company to another? The Europeans expect this to happen for all software and data. So what that means is this. For example, let's say an EU user of youneedabudget.com, which is YNAB, it's a budgeting app. Uh, which is a competitor to uh, everydollar.com, which is owned by Ramsey Solutions here. So a YNAB user says, hey, YNAB, you know, it's been great, but I'm switching to every dollar. Under European law, YNAB and Dave Ramsey's company have to get together and facilitate the transfer of data behind the scenes so that the user can seamlessly switch between them. I don't know how that's going to be enforced, and vice versa, by the way. So if someone's an everydollar.com user and they're like, yep, see ya, I'm going YNAB, uh, they would have to facilitate it the other direction. Um, I do not see this starting to happen. Their data standards, um, yeah, this, this is really gonna trip up a lot of companies because the breadth of that interpretation is just crazy. <clears throat> I don't know how many data migrations you've all done, but. They're not trivial. And oh, you cannot charge for this. You have to do the transfer within a strict time frame and without charging. So while GDPR compliance is not a software feature, it is a business process, we're gonna, as programmers, as developers, we're going to have to be able to implement software going into the future that can deal with this. So that's why we're here today. So lawful basis. Um, all data processing has to have a lawful basis. And just because we want to do it is not a lawful basis. So some of that could be consent. That is the specific um, consent of a user for a specific purpose. Uh, contractual necessity. So again, our mortgage servicer. So if we uh, are a mortgage servicer and people owe, owe us money because they have a home loan and they're paying it off, we have a contractual necessity to track who they are, you know, send them bills, make sure they paid us, so, so if someone in that situation asks us to delete their data, we don't have to because we have a legal basis that's not consent because it's contractual necessity. Compliance with legal obligations. So if we run a bank software and we have to keep financial records for seven years, then we can, um, we can do that and others see the law. So consent has to be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. Uh, the unambiguous point is gonna catch a lot of people. Pre-tick boxes don't count. 
and users must be able to withdraw consent at any time. So our software, if, if we take data and we send it to a cloud service provider and we copy it to a spreadsheet and we do all sorts of things with it, if someone withdraws consent, we have to go to all those places and claw it back. Like we can't just keep it because we had consent at one point. So that changes how we design our software. And Apple started doing this. Notice that that box is not ticked. I noticed that today. <laughs> And the data privacy impact assessment is a document, and there are requirements under the European law for what has to be in this document and who has to sign off on it. And it has to be at the start of every project that would have any material impact or processing of customer data. So let's design some software. Any questions yet? Yes? My understanding is it has to be machine readable and so at least a best effort at being an unambiguous XML or CSV format probably is compliant for now, but that's not where they ultimately want it to be. Uh, so from a software point of view, I would say the biggest thing right now is you have to have an export function. So step one. So these are some practical examples for your Ruby app. Uh, so who here ha is familiar with the filter parameter logging.rb in your, in your thing? Awesome. By default, how many things are listed in there? It's like just the password, right? So add more stuff. Because <laughs> um, one of the things that you can do here is not have sensitive data in your log files. means that your log files don't have to be protected like Fort Knox. Um, logging sensitive data like Twitter did happens all the time, and since it's not just passwords, it's things like people's surnames or their IP addresses, you really don't want those hiding around your logs to the extent that you don't need them to be. Now, you may need security logging, so there might be some exceptions, so think it through. But yeah, don't log if you don't need it. Uh, turn on force SSL. Who all does this every time? Sweet. Okay, that's an improvement. So Rails has this nice feature that if you set force SSL to true, it will, if someone hits the website, it will redirect it to the SSL version and will turn on strict transport security, the HSTS headers, which helps you a lot. We have Brakeman and Bundler Audit. So these, how many people use these tools? Awesome. Uh, Brakeman is a static analysis tool. It looks through your Rails code and highlights a lot of the common ways that web applications get pwned. And so as you make those mistakes, it flags them. Um, and then you need to correct it. And it's also really great when you integrate this with your Travis CI or your other CI tool because it can be one of those code quality things that you have to pass before you ship code. Um, it'll solve about 51% or so of the things that can get you really hurt, but at least you're, cut, you're, you're, having, you're raising your baseline. Um, I mean, even with my own code, I've been doing this for years. I, I make mistakes that it flags. I'm like, oh yeah, I need to do that different. Uh, Bundler Audit uh, looks through your gem file and tells you about third-party dependencies that have active CVEs against them. So it's a great tool so, to keep track of things that you need to update. Uh, there's a GDPR Rails gem. It adds some fun stuff. John pointed this out to me earlier. Thank you, sir. It's the first I heard of it. Uh, so it adds some, gives you an engine to do policy enforcement, adds a bunch of stuff to your models. Uh, makes things a little easier so you don't have to invent it from scratch, so check it out. And it gives you a nice little baseline admin interface for your compliance tools like responding to data requests and, and things. So here's a good example. So as a user, I read your awesome blog post. I'm on your website and I want to subscribe to a mailing list. So pull the audience, what could go wrong? Okay, what else? Yes, and? Oh, so you subscribe them to all mailing lists. So that's a potential. And your mailing list is hosted by a third party. That's a, another very real potential. So you're sending it to a third party without consent. You're not getting consent for everything. The word here is consent. So there's some examples here. So you can't just have an e enter your email and hit subscribe anymore. This are some examples. They have a checkbox that's not ticked. 
And if you click on the terms and conditions, you get a modal dialog with literally this content here. And it covers several things. So it covers uh, that all of their data is being shared with Microsoft 365. So specifically who it's being shared with, for what purpose um, and region. That, that the personal data, which in this case is the email, is stored until unsubscribed. And where to write, uh, you have to give a physical address to contact for um, exercise of your European rights. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe you can word it in such a way to give you some leeway, but that is my understanding. And then who has access to the data? Here's another one. So your CEO comes to you and says, OK, give me a database dump out of the database of all the emails and send them to Steven Marketing so that he can load them up into MailChimp. So pull the audience. What's the answer to this? No. Or what is your lawful basis? <laughs> um, CEOs love that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Highly risky, given the GDPR. Like, highly risky. Uh, confirm that the CEO envisions what he envisions, he or she, is a lawful business purpose that the user has already consented to. <laughs> so if you do not have consent ahead of time, you can't do it. Um, also, specific contract terms must be in place with the guy in marketing, <laughs> especially if he's a contractor. And so, yeah, the answer is pretty much no. <laughs> uh, did you get the permission of the data protection officer? Um, so as a borrower who owes your company a lot of money, I know Dave Ramsey's company would love this one, uh, I want to exercise my right to be forgotten. Please delete all records of my existence. <laughs> so again, uh, nice try. But uh, there are basis for processing data other than consent. And in this case, there's a contractual obligation that has to remain enforced. Uh, however, uh, if, noth if the payment, if the mortgage is paid off in full and I exercise my right to be forgotten, you have to delete my data then. So as if I never even existed to you. I mean, you can anonymize it, and I guess, and say that you had a home loan for X number of dollars that was paid off in X number of months. But... That's it. You can't have anything about me left in your system. Yes. Yeah, but it can be from an anonymous customer who has exercised the right to be forgotten as of a certain date. Yes. Not under, not under European law. I'm not an attorney. <laughs> if you're in Europe, this is very enforceable. To the extent it can be enforced here, um, I'm trying to keep this talk to, towards the standpoint of we have to design software that could be used in the Eurozone. So, um, but yeah, that sounds like a great question for lawyers. Um, and uh, the peanut gallery for the rest of the year after May 26th, start seeing where stuff goes. So as an SEO consultant, I need you to add this JavaScript to the template so that I can do some fun things. What can go wrong here, y'all? What is, what is one thing private data includes? Back Way back earlier slide. IP addresses, cookies. You have to get consent. So that has to be built into your software. And if they don't consent, you have to still render the page without the thing that they didn't consent to. Um, so IPs are PII. Is it necessary for business? Was there a data impact assessment? Uh, were the terms of service updated ahead of time to inform the customers of the presence of this third-party JavaScript code? Has an audit been done of the third-party company that offered the JavaScript code so that we have all the assurances in place that they are compliant with all the regulations? So the answer is usually no. We don't add third-party JavaScript, um, or there needs to be a really good business reason to do it. As a user, I want to be able to freely access information about processing activities that involve my PII so that I can exercise my right to view my process PII. So how would you implement this? This is open discussion. I'm pretty sure I didn't do a, yep. That's part of, I want to try these together. So, so article 17 was it, the right to access? How would you design for this? What are some of the concerns? So the answer was that you have to keep track of where all the places the data is. This is called a data asset register, and it is something you're expected to do as part of your design and operations. <clears throat> so if it's strewn, 
across tables, across databases. Doesn't matter. You have to build a map of every place it, it goes. What else? It's pretty foreign stuff, huh? Right? They need a business, a lawful business purpose for information access. So that means our back end user portals are going to have to get a lot more complicated, huh? <clears throat> so if, if, if your, your information is ingle mingle, intermingled with someone else's, that's a great question. That could get pretty sticky, couldn't it? So then the question actually becomes, on the Facebook example, uh, there may be provisions that deal with um, data that's been manifestly made public by the data subject. But here's where it gets tricky. Like if I turned around and took a picture of all of us and they don't know who you are, can they? Yeah, photos are one of those things. They are identifiable PII. I don't know how the enforcement will work. Um, so, you know, someone's on security footage and they exercise the right to be, do you have to like go through and blur out everyone else? Is that something that's automatable? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. Uh, so we'll try a couple more. So as a user, I want to be able to provide slash withdraw consent to from process my PC, PII so that I can have control over how my PII is processed. Okay, what are our design considerations? You have to have contractual basis or informed unambiguous consent. Right, but I mean like so if they read through all the other things. No, that's not allowed. So apparently my understanding is that uh, terms of service have to be easy to understand. And so there is, uh, and not overly long. So writing everything into the terms of service and hiding it behind a single checkbox is probably not going to, is not going to pass muster. So my understanding is that it depends on what is, a lot of this is not necessarily, so you have the contractual basis, right? So the idea is that you, a customer is doing business with you for a specific purpose. So the business processes that are related to servicing that business purpose, that contractual obligation, you know, that a reasonable person would consider reasonable, I expect my mortgage servicer to send me a bill in the mail and I expect to pay it and if something goes wrong, I expect communications about, hey, your payment didn't go through, please correct it within the next 15 days or you know, this bad thing will happen to you. I expect those things, right? Or a reasonable person would. What I do not expect is to get credit card marketing offers from some other partner company because the data was shared just because they, after the fact, decided that my data was valuable to sell or share with someone else. So that would be a, 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 an activity that was not part of the contractual basis, and yet I would have to have specific unambiguous consent before they could do it. So the idea is to catch all those things. So, so really what, what they want to do is make personal data not worth the hassle to deal with. So biz, to encourage businesses not to base business models off of sharing and monetizing data except in providing the contracted services that the customer contracted for, which is, you know, going to change interesting things. Yep. That is true. Um, so, I mean, that, that can happen. Um, you do have to deal with the fact that, I mean, again, this goes back to how much enforcement can they do across international borders? How much exposure do you have into the Eurozone? Those are legal questions. But if we're designing software that's capable of being compliant, we have to start thinking about these obligations. Otherwise, our software is going to be a mess. Anything else on this one? I mean, I know everyone's like, I love compliance. I work with code all day, and now I get to think about law stuff in foreign countries. <laughs> so as a user, I want to be able to consent and withdraw my consent easily. So to all uses of my, my data. So how do you implement this? Or what questions do you need to ask the writer of this user story? I guess they wouldn't write it exactly like this one today. It's like someone gets it. So here's a scenario. Your software is going around, you know, in May 26th, someone says, I want to withdraw my consent to have my data, you know, used for advertising, shared with anybody. This is like the unsubscribe on steroids. How are you going to comply? 
with your current system? Is your admin going to run around like crazy, like logging into different systems, looking for every mention, trying to cancel or delete processing? Or is, are you going to build it into the software that you control that orchestrates these things? So how would you start to build that in? I guess it's more centralization. What else? What are some concerns? 30 days. <laughs> no, 30 days. So, you know, you can imagine this is going to overwhelm a lot of companies that weren't prepared to the extent they're con the consent with withdrawn. You know, I don't know exactly. Um, if they, I presume you would need to do something that would make them comfortable that they did that. Otherwise, they could complain to a regulatory authority and then they demand you show how you are compliant with GDPR principles to have enforced that. So, <laughs> correct. And this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go back and uh, backups. Okay, so there's a lot of discussion about backups. So, you know, we back up our entire database. We keep backups for 90 days, 180 days, whatever. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go back and delete all that because lots of people have tape backups. They have cloud service backups. Uh, you, one of the things that's been done by companies being compliant is to have a register of data that has been deleted so that if a backup has to be restored, it can be redeleted before going live. Another thing people have done is and do um, segregation using encryption keys. So, for example, if different customer records are encrypted with different keys and you throw away the key, then you've effectively deleted the data from the backups. So there's different IT strategies um, to implement this in software. And resources. We got some books. So uh, of these, actually, the, I bought the blue one first, and it was OK. Uh, the Fix It Fast book was really great. Um, so I recommend that highly. So it's very approachable. It's something that your management could read as well. Um, so I think it's worth the $10 on, on Kindle. Um, really great podcast. I, I listened to it again on the way up here, is the GDPR guy. Um, he also offers services as a data protection officer for hire. He's out of London. So he's like a fractional DPO, kind of like you have a fractional CTO. Um, it's very useful. Uh, GDPR-info.eu is a, a web browsable version of all the rules. It's actually fairly readable. So you get to play, you know, paralegal lawyer like I did and actually read like Article 17 and, you know, all the different things. So, you know, I'm not an attorney, so read it for yourself. <laughs> And that's it. Thanks. Yes, awesome Ruby. Um, any Ruby specific Rails questions on compliance situations you want to spitball through? Yes. So company data is not protected. Oh, yes. So the question is, so you have like a professional relationship with, so let's say someone works for a company and you have their business card. Okay, so you have the information on their business card. Um, that gets tricky. All information about natural people at all times that are subject to GDPR is subject to GDPR. Company names and addresses are not, but there are some things that are required. So. For, the law requires you to give the personal contact details for the data protection officer. Does the data protection officer have rights to not have his data thing? Seems like no, right? So it seems like there's some exemptions where, where the, you have to publish you know, who someone is, a director or something. But uh, for one of the things that uh, one of my clients is dealing with is you have uh, someone in Europe working on uh, the floor of like a factory or something. No, like you're not even supposed to put their last name on a name tag without permission because that violates their privacy and there's no legitimate need. So the answer is muddy. Um, I would say if someone hands you a business card and we go back to the same principle as the PII, there's an exemption for uh, information that was manifest manifestly made public by the data subject him or herself. So if someone hands you their card, I presume you can... Your contacts? But then I would... Yeah, it seems like it. But then if they go back and say, I would like you to forget about me, 
you would need to, need to comply with that. So yes, your, um, your iPhone contacts, your Google contacts are subject to GDPR. Uh, anyone notice that they stopped publishing who is records? ICANN's doing that um, before the compliance headline. So you used to be able to look up and see who the domain owner was and the contact. That's all blinked out now because of GDPR. Nope. <laughs> I never paid that because it never bothered me. <laughs> I've had domains for so long. Um, I do have a UPS store address, so I guess that is... Um, <laughs> So yeah, and, and that helps too for other reasons. So my wife is a mental health counselor. So when she has to have an address on her license that's on the wall in her office, I mean, she doesn't like me to use this word, but I was like, so you see crazy people and they have our home address on the wall right in front of them. Maybe we should use the UPS store address. <laughs> um, yeah, so anything else? Yes. Specific and oh, so the question was okay. So the question is that say we offer a white paper for download, and in order to download it, you have to give up some personal information. You have to say like who you are, how to contact you, and hit submit. Um, no, that would not be sufficient. So you need to get specific, unambiguous, and informed consent from the user for the use of their data. And there are potentially obligations to not withhold services just for not providing that. So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, in the case of, of data that you're giving away like that, I would not be surprised if the answer is no. You still have to give them the white paper that you're publishing widely. Now, maybe you can then charge them. M maybe you can say, you can either sign up to our mailing list or you can pay us $5 for this report. You know, maybe you can do it somewhere like that in Bitcoin because they want to be anonymous. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. You can, and you can actually also collect it for the purpose of detecting and preventing fraud. So, you know, the question comes up of, say, web application or web server logs. Can you keep them? And the answer is you do have a pass there. You don't need consent. Uh, you, you may need to inform them of this in the terms and conditions, and you shouldn't keep it forever. So there's a principle of, of how long you can keep data, and one of the big things with GDPR is you, you delete data at the moment after it is no longer necessary to do your job. So the way I've heard this interpreted is if you have a... So, so, so yes, you can do that, but you have to have a data retention policy, and you have to have the data retention policy technically enforced. So, for example, um, in the case of, say, web server logs, uh, if, if you rotate your logs and at the end of a period they, they, just, they get deleted automatically, so let's say that you could make a statement that, you know, we log, you know, your browser information, IP address, and other headers for the purpose of detecting and preventing fraud and we retain that information for 90 days, then you're in the clear. Yes? The question is, so when I send an email, it gets relayed, bounced all the way around the world and back, or multiple hosts it goes through, and, and each of those hosts could inspect my email, see my email address. Um, is that some form of implied consent? I guess so. <laughs> that sounds like more of a legal question. So I presume they're not intending to shut down email? Hopefully not. Um, but th definitely there's a lot of rules around using email for marketing. So that would be, yes, sir. Yeah, so, I mean, if the servers actually use TLS between themselves, yes, then they would. So the bouncing. Um, so the examples I've seen is stating to your data subjects that you use Office 365, you use Google Apps for Business as your email service provider, that you're sharing their personal data with that, you're using MailChimp to relay your messages. Um, I haven't seen that it's necessary to go and try to enumerate all the possible email paths to their destination. Um, so the, the main thing is who are you sharing their data with and who, who can see it. 
crazy Europeans. Exactly. And, and that gets started on May 26th. So MailChimp's a data processor. And yes, uh, the data processor is responsible to only processing um, data at the specific written direction of the data controller and is responsible for ensuring technical compliance with security standards and for detecting and notifying on any breach of protected data um, and all other obligations under the GDPR other than deciding what the data is used for. That's the biggest def difference between a processor and a controller. Uh, there could be cases actually where you're what's called under their terms a data coprocessor excuse me, co-controller, and that would be a situation where you ha you aren't just working at the explicit written direction of the data controller, but are also making decisions about how the data is used. So, the long way to say, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Did everyone hear the question? I just started answering it. So the, the question was, if you're just a service provider like a SaaS, um, are you responsible under the GDPR? And the answer is yes. If you're a just a processor and not a co-controller, you have to tell your controller, and your controller has to inform the regulatory authorities within 72 hours of the discovery of the breach. So you have to tell them fast. Uh, did anyone hear that? Actually, let me repeat that. So the point was that right now we think of data breaches like, man, this you know, 148 million Americans' financial data was accessed because Equifax was breached. We're now going to see that... Um, Joe, Joe Schmo at Acme Corporation inadvertently uploaded a spreadsheet that included the last name and uh, phone number of 13 customers. <laughs> and now that's a reportable data breach uh, to the extent that those users were impacted. I think technically, yes. I doubt they will actually do that every time, but yes. Uh, even worse, the moment that someone in your company looks at the list of names for a yeah, yeah, surface over your shoulder for a business purpose not specifically enumerated and pre-consented for, then that's a breach as well. Yeah, so basically data is toxic. Anything else? I, this is the first gem I've seen that's tried to bundle up a lot of this functionality, um, and I just took two screenshots. So I would just go look it up. It's called GDPR underscore Rails. And it looks like it's a fairly new project. I mean, it would have to be, right? But it's, it's starting to lay the groundwork to giving you some tools so that you don't have to create this from scratch. They seem to have had something in here to help with like the exporting thing too. Like, you know, to do the show me. So I have a user account and then everything. So, you know, user tables, if you use device, immediately the email address field and those IP address fields are protected PII. So... You know, those, those are interesting. Um, yes. Yes, there are. So the question is, I'm sorry, the question is, are there requirements around encryption at rest and other, and other protections for, for PII? The answer is yes. Um, that is, I don't know how much that's required by law and how much that is just kind of the uh, wisdom of the crowd of, peop of companies implementing have basically all gone to down the path of encrypt everything at all times. Uh, it definitely helps with compliance if you can show that your data was encrypted at rest. You know, you didn't have a data breach if the person who inadvertently got access to it didn't also have the key to decrypt. So that protects you from a heck of a lot of things. Um, it is not going to protect you from everything, but it, it is worth it. I don't want to say no because I'm not a legal expert. Every company I know that's doing implementation is using encryption very pervasively. So, And that also helps too because remember I mentioned segregating client records with different keys so that if you delete the key, you delete the data. So that helps you a lot. And um, from a practical basis, let's say you have password hashes or passwords. You wouldn't want hash it. You wouldn't want to ever do a plain text password. Similarly, you really don't want to have developer or, or definitely people with access to data's laptops not fully encrypted at rest. You know, it gets weird. Like you have to have data controls around things like... Um, antivirus and uh, if you have an antivirus installed but it's not effective, it's not as configured correctly, uh, that could be a breach of, of GDPR and could result in fines. <laughs> it's going to be entertaining. This is going to be like a crazy year. I, I don't have any idea what's about to happen but I had a feeling that we're going to see some um, 
the corporate equivalent of perp walks uh, with, with uh, not doing data security right. I'm not sure, even as much as I love security, I'm not sure I'm thrilled about that, but I mean, I didn't make the rules. Well, I guess we're coming up on time. Thank you, everyone.